talking to Paul Amato, a PAL resident, um, writer, actor, who's been in the business for a number of years, and we're here to talk about what you've been up to, even more recently or in your past, uh, whatever you're comfortable about talking about. This is from the archives, and uh, yeah. you've been a PAL resident for how long? Um, I believe I'm going into the 11th year, 10th year, 10 years anyways. Yeah. So, where are you from, Paul? Um, well, I was born in Italy, but raised in the beaches. So, oh, the beach of Toronto, whatever. When you say born in Italy, what part of Italy were you? Uh, southern part of Italy, Calabria, Santo Stefano, which is a small town in Calabria. Um, Any memories of that? Uh, uh, they're vague. They're, you know, I, 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 my parents came here when I was like three years old, so I, um, I have some images and memories, but they're just fragmented, you know, they're not and, and solid. And as, as an immigrant myself, who came over when he was uh, seven, uh, do you remember a boat ride? Uh, I was told by my mother that I cried all the way across <laughs> on that boat, because I didn't really want to leave. So, um, <laughs> I, I never got seasick, I seemed to be okay with that, but I was just not... Not happy. Not happy about going wherever we were going. Yeah. Some immigrants' experience is, is remembering Pier 51 in Halifax. I, I was a little too young for that, but yes, that uh, did happen. Uh, we, uh, I believe the boat landed in Halifax, and then uh, a train uh, from there to... Um, we had relatives that were already in Toronto and in the beaches, and that's what uh, brought us so. over. So that's what where we ended up, yeah. Now, so you're right on the beaches, and presumably Canadian education, high school, yeah, college, uh, what? All of the above. Um, I was, uh, I went to pub, uh, Key Beach Public School, uh, Fairmount Park Secondary School, grades seven and eight. They had that separated at one time, and then Monarch Park High School, which is all in the east end of Toronto. And did, did you have an interest in drama and Monarch? Or was there any programs yes, there? Yes, in, in we had a. <laughs> We had a teacher, I forgot her name, but she was um, a wannabe actress who had um, actually had done some stuff and wanted to be on Broadway, but eventually got a job as an acting teacher. And it wasn't, in high school, it was a secondary thing. It was something you could take as an option. It was an additional class. It wasn't um, a part of your main curriculum. But um, I did enjoy it. It was fun, and it was escapism, and I got to do a lot of different play during that thing. Um, I screwed up the big exam. Half the marks were for <laughs> for makeup. You, you never did makeup. But here comes the graduating uh, class thing, and it was because they needed something real and physical. Right. So whatever the inter whatever your audition was, that was fine. But that was fifty percent. The other fifty percent of your mark was for makeup, which I hadn't done, and I made a mess of it and scored lower than I should have because I lost a lot of it on the makeup. Uh, which is uh, I eventually I learned to do some makeup on my own, but now you don't need it anymore. And did you progress to college, or did you go directly to work, or how did that, how did that work out? Um, well. After high school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I I uh, worked at different jobs. I, I didn't go straight to college. I, I worked um, as a, a postal worker for a while. Anything memorable? What do you mean? Well, anecdotal. Something about... <laughs> going go to the postal, I don't know. I Actually, I, I spent um, Christmas doing postal work as well. Yeah, well, no, I ended up working there for half a year and then quit. And then I worked as a cable installer when Rogers was first coming oh, in. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, I used to, um, I just, all I did was run the cable. So, oh, okay. um, one of the biggest jobs was this warehouse where I had to be up on a 50-foot ladder and run cable a thousand <laughs> feet to the other end and get it across. The money was pretty good. And it, had I been a smart person, I could have bought a house down the street. <laughs> in the beaches. In the beaches. When they were affordable. For ten thousand dollars, it would now be worth a million and a half. <laughs> but that never, that thought never even crossed my mind back then. So I worked. I quit. I took a trip to California, to Los Angeles for a month. I had a thousand dollars. I lived 
through uh, uh, expensively for that month, staying at the Hyatt and a few other places. And that's when I realized what did I really want to do with myself, which was uh, uh, acting. And mostly because everybody I met was an actor, the gardener, the waitress, <laughs> the bus uh, driver, the bartender. They were all actors, but they needed another job so they could still keep right. going. So I thought, oh, I could do that. I could go back to Toronto, become an actor, and do all these other jobs to continue living. <laughs> so that's kind seemed of... Seemed like a plan. It seemed like something, yeah. <laughs> Besides going to California and just wasting a lot of money, you know, going to bars hanging and out. hanging out. Yeah. So you came back to Toronto and enrolled, or...? And um, I was looking for something to do, and in the paper, newspaper, there was... Ken Gass was offering classes at, oh gosh, what was the name of his, uh, um, Factory Lab? The Factory Lab, thank you very much, yes. Factory Lab at Bathurst and, uh... No, 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 this was way before then. It became at Bathurst later on, but yeah. this was on DuPont. Oh, okay, right, the original one up at DuPont, because now it's not at Bathurst and Adelaide, but yes. It was a Jar... No, wait a second, it was at Jarvis. Jarvis and... Oh, I can't remember. I know, it's a long time ago. But it was a, it was a, a, an old little studio. Right. And um, he had classes for 125 bucks for five weeks, twice a week at night. So I could still do a job during the day and take the classes. I did it for, I took three of his classes. One, you know, the, the beginner, the intermediate, and then whatever. And then uh, eventually we ended up by doing a play where I met another pal person here. Um, <laughs> oh gosh, what's his name now? We all know it. Uh, he played Robin Hood on for a while. Um, uh, no, Paul, no, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know who you're fishing for here. Um, Luxley. What? Luxley. Yes, James Loxley. Thank you very much, Nora. James Loxley, who was also in like Ken's classes, and uh, we played. I, I play, It was um, a dream play by Strindberg. I played the young soldier, he played myself 20 years later. So it was <laughs> an odd thing to then meet here at Powell many <laughs> years later. later. Right. <laughs> uh, so it was interesting. But so what was your first professional gig? Do you remember? In theater or in film or TV? Yeah, there was always theater that started it for me. Um, what do you mean by professional? Do well, you mean like an equity contract or you mean... Well, I suppose it is, it, is, it is a bit of a fuzzy question, you know. Yeah. Because a gig. Well, the first paid gig was for um, a children's theater company. Um, gosh, I should have brought my resume so I could actually look up stuff. Oh, I don't think I've ever put that down on my resume. Uh, <laughs> it was with Florence Ford, and I forget her company's name. And uh, I played a couple of characters, one of which was um, a... a I, I, I don't know, an ogre, no, he was, uh, I forget, but anyways, it was, it was shows for young kids, and I was paid $200 for the show, and that was my first gig. Well, that, must have been, that felt good. It felt good to get paid, you yeah. Know? My first professional gig, my equity job, okay. was, um, I mean, I got paid for a number of shows, non-equity, but I got paid for, uh, I, it was a soap opera on Young Street, um, oh man, oh man, Solar Stage, they were uh, very popular back then, and a number of actors went through it. It was lunchtime theater, and um, I got to play Maximo Cupido, uh, an Italian who owned the restaurant, and um, I got it because I did Italian accents and a few, a few other things, and uh, and it gave me my equity card, and it was a soap opera. So audiences would line up and have their lunch while sitting there, coming from the offices, and basically uh, watch a play. And each week there would be the next episode. It was quite the job, because we had seven weeks and, uh, of different shows. And so you had to learn one, do it for two shows for a week, right. then learn another one while you were... By the third week, you had so many scripts in your head. It was <laughs> rather tricky, but workable. Yeah. Good training. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, um, you've got a number of, of theater credits here. We can talk about sort of various different stuff. But mm -hmm. um, 
I just want to run through a couple of them. You've done the mouse trap a couple of different times, I notice. Yes. You've done the Scrooge, yes. Romeo and Juliet, Cherry Orchard. Yes. The Tarantula. Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually, I, I brought a few reviews from some <laughs> just to, because those. Well, were, which of those uh, I just mentioned uh, stand out in your mind uh, in terms of memory? Um, Dracula, uh, the Cherry Orchard. Um, what was the other one? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was Romeo and Juliet where you played. Oh yeah, I played uh, uh, Father Capulet or Capulet basically. And then there is uh, the Mousetrap. We showed them a couple of times. On yeah, the Mouse Trap, I played uh, two different roles, and not the one on Bloor West, which was on forever, for 23 years. I actually did it um, in Collingwood and uh, in Port Hope, uh, two different productions um, at uh, prominent theaters. And Port Hope Theater is a beautiful the capital theater. is a 400-seat theater that was totally renovated and lovely. There I played... Um, um, Pervacini is a man with a piano who plays it with a one of finger. <laughs> and uh, in, in Collingwood, I, I played Detective Sergeant Shorter, who was actually the police detective who comes in to find out what's going on here. Where, why are all these people stuck in this place? And you know, whatever, I don't know if you know the most trap or not. I've, I've, I've seen it. Oh, right. right. I've seen it. So, Yes. So, I'm familiar with Agatha Christie and, and, and her work. Yeah, I also was in another Agatha Christie play there, um, Ten Little Indians. Oh, Ten Little Indians, which I'm quite yeah. fond of. Yeah, I played yeah. Bloor, Detective Sergeant Bloor, another character that was, you know, no, uh, it was kind of evil, but... Uh, and Dracula. Yes. Van Helsing. Van Helsing, yes. Let's talk about that. You got a review there? Yeah, I have a small review. I br only brought that one because. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. But no, I, I loved Dracula. Did it in several places. Uh, did it in uh, Brantford originally. And um, we used uh, the Bell Homestead as the house and then the barn as a place. And it was, it was a good production there. But then we took it to Casa Loma. And it ran there. We thought it was going to be like one weekend. It ended up running for five years. Oh, really? Uh, in the fall, for October, Halloween, right. and then for uh, Valentine's Month, because it seems to be a love story, and for Valentine's Month, and we sold it out for a lot of the time. It was quite impressive. But for that particular one, for opening night, um, there's a whole long review. I'll just read my part. <laughs> for the record. Yes. I must also give accolade to Paula Mata, who pulled off one of the be better performances of Professor Van Helsing I've seen since Sir Anthony Hopkins took the role in 1992, Dracula. Which, the reason I wanted to read that was because they compared me to Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> and I thought, well, okay, I like that. <laughs> uh, what, what did you like about the Van Helsing character that you played it? Oh, I, I like that he was a genius. I could never be that smart. Um, I couldn't even come close. I mean, he has his three, three doctrines, two masters. Uh, he speaks five languages. Um, what his, I loved the idea of playing uh, a genius. And he's fearless. So how is the play structured? Is it like the Stoker novel? Because Van Helsing comes in towards the middle part of the novel. Oh, no, not in, in this particular thing. I mean, yes, you think of Dracula, you, you go think to Dracula. the opening and... and yeah. uh, but no, Marcus. really, you follow Van Helsing through more of it than you, you know, you followed everybody in the house. Yeah. We used Casa Loma. Um, up and down the stairs, we had rooms set up for different scenes. We had to have an audience follow us through to different places, and we had to figure out how to move them right. without uh, disrupting them. The main stuff was in the on the main floor, which is now a huge bar. They've taken that out. But... Um, it was a gorgeous place to, to work it and to do it. And right. the audience got to see Casa Loma as well as the play and scenes in uh, different rooms and in uh, the dungeon even. We used that for the first year and then we stopped using it after a while. But um, it was quite the impressive show. And it really did, it was a hit. It, um, You've done uh, a lot of work at the Bell, the Bell um Bill Homestead. Yeah. yeah, you've done work there before, haven't you? Uh, yeah, I've done I don't know how many shows. Um, but basically, that. Uh, well, what is that? What is? Describe okay. that a bit, because I think people know who you're talking about, Alexander Graham Bell. It was his home. It's now a museum. 
It was moved from one location to another. But we used the front of the house and the grounds to do our plays. And so most of the plays, most of them were period pieces. We would do some children's shows and stuff, but most of them were period pieces. And so the house fit in so well um, there because uh, we would use the front porch as part of our set. I've used the back, I've used the barn. Um, I directed some shows there. Um, and so... Uh, and you've also written some material too, haven't you? Yeah, I've, I've written a few plays, mostly um, family stories. Um, Pinocchio was one of my favorites, uh, which was an ad adaptation from the book, and we did that one and toured it to some schools as well. But we did it as dinner theater originally, and then took it to schools. And, and who were and who were you? Were you I was uh, Geppetto. Geppetto, sorry. Yes, and um, and Peter directed most of these plays. I've been friends with Peter Muir for years, and uh, we started theater together. And so um, we've had long-standing three different companies. I was a founding member of BTW, but then I eventually got out of that. And now it's his thing. Um, okay. All right. Now. Let's just shift gears for a second because you've also, and going back into the resume that provided me with, been working in film since the, um, the early 1980s. Yes, uh, my film career is coming, it comes and goes, and it's never been Well, stated. because there, there's, there's one called The War Brides, which yeah. Martin Levat directed, yes. which was nominated for, for a number of Canadian Film Awards, I believe. Yeah, and Genies, uh, I believe. It was. Yeah, yeah, it was. And, uh, and Martin was a lovely man. I played, uh, what did I play in that, Brad? I was the brother, the younger brother in the scene, and I. And you were you were in a E N G, which is a very popular series. But yes. also see Braveheart Shift Two, which was I think shot in Toronto, right? It was, <laughs> it was, yeah. And I played the. It was a film within a film in that one, and uh, I was the. F um, Jerry Chicoretti. Yeah, yeah, Jerry Chicoretti. Yeah. yeah, and I was a what the line producer, and so I would come and go as the, as the film was being made. But once the story got to um, demonic stages, <laughs> the film sort of dissolved and then it went on to the horror part of it, whatever. No, no, I, 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 I love doing films, uh, and whenever they pop up, or whenever I score, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, theater has always been a staple. It's, it's been something that I've managed to get more work in it, that's all, no. really. I, I did a lot of commercials for a while as well. I don't know, 30 or 40 of them over many, many years. Lately, I haven't scored one. I had a call back for the one the other day. Remember that one, uh, Norm? I got a call back, but I never got the job. <laughs> and, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I hope they hire someone that doesn't look anything like me, that I won't feel so bad. Now, what are you up to? What are you up to these days? And like I say, you're you're a pal, and you've been here for for nearly a dozen years, or at least ten years. At least ten. Yeah. I think ten years. Yeah, and I lost track of time. Um, you just continue to work, right? I have I mean, continued to work right through. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I mean, I know we're in the time of COVID, so that's probably problematic. No, I've been working through COVID. Really? You've Compared been... to other people, I have managed to do two um, voiceover video uh, uh, pieces, um, a virtual. Uh, they're like um, they're like radio, but you can watch the actors voice them on camera. Uh, I did a movie as soon as they opened up in Ottawa. I was in a film that is called, it's supposed to come out this spring now, um, called Daddy's Perfect Little Girl. And I play the neighbor, Albert Foster, who is um, not a very pleasant man, but uh, he doesn't trust this, uh, the, 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 the 12 year old girl. He doesn't like her and he doesn't trust her. And uh, he knows that she's up to no good, so. He's the obnoxious neighbor, but I, I mean, unless they cut it so that I won't recognize it, but I don't think so. I should be in the, at least the first hour of the film, whatever. Any, any, any role models, anyone that you... you oh, and I did a play. 
when nobody else was doing a play on World Theater Day, which was March 27th, we did a play with masks on, 40 feet away from the audience. Um, it was supposed to be shot virtually so you could watch it at home, and a dinner theater project there, uh, celebrating the uh, Italians of Brantford that helped build the city of Brantford. And um, that was, what, a couple of weeks ago. I've still got another show there, and I have an audition tomorrow for something in Ottawa, which uh, who knows. It's all, most of this has become virtual. Most of the jobs are now online. So. Now, back to my question. Any sorry. role models that you might have had? Any person that you looked to? You said you liked that, but you were pleased with some of Andrew Hopkins. Yeah, that's someone I always admired and um, think he's just, you know. Who's up for another Oscar? You got a BAFTA for, for The Father. Yeah, great. Yeah, you just got a BAFTA for that. Yeah, no, he's he's an amazing genius, you know. I mean, of course, all the all of them. I love Brando, Pacino, um, anybody. Pacino, I, I used to follow him at at, at first. I, I actually, he um, we did the first production in Canada, um, playing Murphy in. Uh, oh gosh. It was Pacino won an OB, OB award for it on, on off Broadway. Right. Uh, and now, I, again, I can't remember the name, but maybe it's there. Maybe it's on the list of plays that. Um, it should be. News on the second page. Then. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to keep too many pages, so I've cut a lot. I mean, <laughs> I've actually done about 150 plays. Oh, okay. And I'm yeah. just. Uh, I only stopped at a hundred marking or something, and right. I'm the forgetting of it. Well, Pacino is an actor who who does turn to, to to theater a lot a lot of time. Oh yeah, yeah, no, and I know he's known for <laughs> film roles, but he does do a lot of uh, theater work. Yeah, and he loves Shakespeare. Yeah, he and loves he's Shakespeare. really good at it, actually. I mean, I've heard people try to knock him, uh, and I, I I saw that on Facebook one time, and I said, oh yeah, go and take a look at his uh, uh, Shylock. In the in, in the Merchant of Venice. In the Merchant of Venice. And his, and his Richard the Third. Oh, he loves Richard the Third. He's been doing it forever. <laughs> and he went to England and you know finding Richard. My goodness, I don't even have that down here. And it was one of. Uh, you it, should update your your resume. No, I mean it was one of the bigger plays that played that year. We were in all the papers. Got excellent reviews. Eh, well, except for Gina Mallet, who was she called us insipid kids that make life so sentimental. I still remember that line. <laughs> but the audiences loved it, and uh, the other two thought we were really, really good, and I liked that about them. But it's funny, you remember the line from someone who put you down more than anything else. Well, one is a good line, but two, uh, you tend to sort of, you know, slings and arrows. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's funny, I don't have it down here. Why not? Well, oh, well. I think we're drifting a bit here, Paul. And I, I am, I am. We, we I should am. probably wrap. <laughs> I didn't know if any sort of thoughts about being a pal? Any thoughts on, on anything that you want to share with the world? Anything on your mind that you'd like to share? <sighs> Remember, this is for our prosperity. The state of the business. Uh, your well, thoughts the on Canadian th theater. I mean, as it stands today, which you came through with time when you say we're, you know, Factory Lab was just a um, little warehouse somewhere. You know? The Indian wants the Bronx. That's the name. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Okay. Because you tap come from where, where there was an explosion of theater in Toronto in the yeah. 70s. Yeah, no, and I know. I came from that. I from that. I mean, Powell benefiting from that. I mean, prior to that, you couldn't find contemporary Canadian theater. 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 That's, that's very true. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I was always trying to get a job at that time and scored a few. And, you know, some of them we had to create our own because there was a certain group of actors. They were all great. Um, you know, Maury Chaikin, uh, uh, R.H. Thompson. R.H. Thompson was still great uh, and still alive and doing well. And, but there was a list of them that got all the major theater jobs. So if you wanted to do theater and be a part of it, you either got lucky and got in one of those shows, or you started creating your own projects right. and then got people to come and see it and hopefully they liked what they saw. Um, Canadian theater, right now, it is in dire straits. Nothing is open, uh, and and some of the cities are foolish. For example, Brantford. Um, I, I'm going to say, and hopefully they don't hear this, but um, well, we could always edit it. No, I don't think it's necessary. It's outdoor theater is the only thing that really you could do right now. I mean, you can do indoor theater, but then you need to sp spread out the audiences and spread out the social actors. distance. Social distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But outdoor theater, you, you have the space, you have the time, and you can socially distance without a problem. Right. But the fear, I mean, yes, there, we do have a pandemic and people are dying all the time, and it's a, a drag, but, you, you know, we could have, you could do outdoor theater and still do that safely, I believe. And I think that's one of the things that should be going on right now. All right. Well, I, I, this is just a little ego boost. It was uh, the best review I ever received from a, a writer, which was, um, uh, Paul Amato was outstanding as the slick-tongued sleazebag Frank, a man who takes philosophical cynicism to impressive new heights. Frank is the corroded heart of this play and the very embodiment of inhumanity. Although gifted in logic and certain about everything, Frank has about as much natural human feeling as the lining of a septic tank. He'll say whatever he needs to say to appease people, but believes none of it, and when things don't go his way, he blows several caskets. For Amato's performance alone, this piece is worth a watch. Still love, and is, uh, it's a hell of a challenge for the character I played. It's a three-hour play, and he's in almost every scene, and and whatever somebody says, no, it's him and Maria, his wife, that carry that show. But anyways, the reviews for that one were, um, I'll just mention my center. The parents of the Tapino family stole the show for me. Giuseppe, played by Paul Amato, and Maria, played by Viviana Zarillo, had superb performances. Their physical comedy, in addition to their exaggerated accents, made them likable characters. Giuseppe's inability to pronounce his grandson's name and had me giggling even after the play was over. That's that one. All right. Uh, this was for the Cherry Orchard at the Guild Theater outside. Um, a lovely production. It was an ambitious show and it was huge. Um, Amato gives a strong performance as the businessman Yermalai. That's, uh, there was other reviews but I couldn't find them. So that's that one. <laughs> People buy their expensive leather jackets and you know, their jewelry and all that sort of stuff. Oh, black, but also one little accessory. A pin, maybe, or maybe you've got something going on. You know, they're always, you know, I always had a Warner Brothers pin, which I discovered, which I found in the Trinity Bellwoods Park in the Sunday afternoon, and it served me so well. All I did was stick it there. And it had a little Bugs Bunny on it, but it had, it had the classic, you know, WB logo on it. And everyone just went for it. You know, like, where'd you get that? So it wasn't like they don't, they don't, you know, and they just ignore the whole, this black and it's just got this thing there and then that was it. And you suddenly you got attention. And you can be talked to, and you know, so it's, it's one of the tricks of the trade. You damn well know that. No, of course they show up in black. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of course. You yeah. don't feel guilty later. <laughs> okay. Someone 200 years from now is going to say, who was that guy? <laughs>